Hi, my name is Tim Bale and I'm co-director of the Mile End Institute at Queen Mary University of London. Welcome to another in our series of videos on the coronavirus COVID-19 crisis. This video features our Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow, Dr Toby Green, who is talking about the way that anti-globalist parties and leaders have reacted and perhaps even tried to uh, exploit uh, the crisis. If you enjoy the video, please share it and please come back for more. Hi, my name is Dr Toby Green and I'm a Marie Curie Research Fellow in the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University in London. We've seen the rise in the West in recent years of radical right parties and leaders who challenge the former liberal consensus on international politics. Donald Trump is the most important example, but there are parties in many countries that share his views about the world. The central principle in their view on international politics is the sovereignty of the nation state. These, they see themselves as fighting back against the processes of globalization, which they see as having gone too far. And there is a dose of populism that often comes into play. Radical right parties and often radical left ones for different reasons often speak as though international global elites are working to undermine the sovereignty and the will of national communities. And those elites include mainstream politicians in their own countries. The anti-globalism of the right means not wanting foreigners to interfere in the affairs of your state and also not wanting to waste the resources of your nation dealing with the problems of other countries when they should be focused on problems at home. So the radical right is instinctively hostile to lots of things that Western liberal democracies have long championed, like attempts to promote democracy and human rights around the world, or spending money on development aid, getting involved in overseas conflicts in the name of humanitarian intervention, multilateral trade agreements, and of course, open borders, which allow high levels of migration, which for the radical right threatens what they see as the ethnic or cultural identity of the nation. In Europe, that translates to hostility towards the EU, which in the minds of the radical right transfers power away from the nation state where it ought to be to the unelected globalist elites in Brussels. Some on the radical right, in their passion to discredit global governance, tend to be sceptical of anything that seems to justify it. So take climate change. The liberal consensus is that it's a global problem that can only be resolved by all countries accepting limits on carbon emissions. Anti-globalists often respond by denying man-made climate change or claiming that it's exaggerated. So how does coronavirus play into this tension between globalism and anti-globalism? As so often in politics, we see politicians interpreting events according to their pre-existing worldviews and in ways that serve their political agendas. For mainstream liberal politicians, coronavirus is more evidence that because we are more international and interconnected than ever, the only way to manage global challenges is through deeper global cooperation. They say no country can solve this on its own. It needs global scientific cooperation, free flow of information and coordinated interventions to tackle the health crisis and support the global economy. So we need strong international institutions like a World Health Organization, a G20 and a European Union. On a more philosophical level, they'll argue this crisis underlines our common humanity and diminishes the significance of national or cultural differences. So how do anti-globalists on the radical right interpret the international politics of these events? Partly this depends on whether they are in power or in opposition. The most prominent anti-globalist in power is Donald Trump. Initially, his response was like climate change. He engaged in a kind of denial, describing the problem as exaggerated. And he's not alone. President Bolsonaro in Brazil, for example, was another who dismissed the crisis as blown out of proportion by the global media. But of course, this is not like climate change. When mass graves are being dug in New York, it's much harder to dismiss the whole thing as overblown. One of Trump's backup responses is to blame others. And this includes blaming foreigners. And who better to blame than the Chinese, with whom he has been engaged in a trade war? In fact, at the end of March, the G7 failed to agree a joint statement on the crisis because the US insisted on calling it the Wuhan crisis, when all the other national leaders just wanted to call it COVID-19. 
A third interesting element of the Trump response has been to try and upend the idea of global scientific cooperation and turn the search for a vaccine into one of national competition by actually trying to buy a German company that was working on a vaccine. What about in Europe? Well, Europe's most prominent radical right nationalist leader, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, this is an opportunity to centralise power and erode checks and balances whilst waving away the human rights concerns of those interfering, unelected Brussels bureaucrats. But what about radical right nationalists in opposition? Well, it varies between countries, but overall it's an opportunity to attack mainstream political rivals, not only on domestic failures in health and social care or in crisis management, but also on international politics. So for Marine Le Pen in France or Matteo Salvini in Italy, globalisation is part of the problem. It's open borders, they say, that have allowed the virus to spread so easily. And it's globalised manufacturing and supply chains that mean national governments can't produce or acquire enough medicine or equipment. The unemployment and other economic challenges that may well be with us longer than the health crisis will be further opportunities for these political actors in the future. This is also an opportunity for them to attack the European Union itself, which has weathered a series of difficult challenges in recent years, including Brexit. In a country like Italy, with its major outbreak and fragile economy, the EU has been attacked as ineffective and failing to show real solidarity when it was needed most. In Germany and the Netherlands, it's the same story in reverse. In Germany, the radical right AFD party will frame this crisis as yet another example of Germany being asked to prop up or bail out weaker and more poorly managed neighbours, just like in the Greek bailout and in the 2015 migration crisis. And it was those crises that helped create the wave of support that carried the AFD into the German national parliament. So will anti-globalist thinking be strengthened or weakened? Many seasoned analysts in the Liberal camp are pessimistic and expect this crisis to accelerate existing trends away from global cooperation. And that's especially because of the absence of the necessary leadership needed from the United States. But the world is a complicated and unpredictable place, so no one really knows how things will play out. The US election will be a significant indicator. If Biden were to beat Trump, it would at least slow the US drift towards isolationism. But more than that, the election will be seen as a referendum on Trump's handling of the crisis. If Trump loses, it may be seen as a judgment, not only on his response to the coronavirus, but the wider political worldview that shaped that response. And it might also strike a blow to politicians that share Trump's anti-globalism in Europe and elsewhere. If Trump wins, of course, it will likely reinforce anti-globalist views, not just in the US, but internationally. Some, either, uh, some other key trends to watch are within the EU itself. The EU is the world's great champion of international cooperation and integration. It has come in for a lot of criticism during the crisis from the member states hardest hit, but it has now agreed a big financial support package for those states. How European publics judge the EU will ultimately be tested in national elections in the years to come. Thanks for listening. You can follow me on Twitter at Toby underscore Green with an E underscore and look out for more videos like this from the Mile End Institute at Queen Mary University of London.